Uh, the vast majority of AI businesses that I love that are, are, are dog shit. I do think that AI implementation for Main Street is an enormous opportunity. The idea of helping businesses implement AI into their business and being very specific and focused about how you want to solve that problem and getting very good at productizing that solution, there is, there's a fortune to be made. Um, obviously, Alex, a huge thank you to you for everything you're doing in the space. I think um, yeah. first and foremost, this has been something that uh, your resources are something that I use every day and it's something that features on the channel and everything we do. So I know you get it all the time and it must get a little bit tiring, but of course, a huge thank you to you and everything you're doing. Um, and for us to be able to support you in any way and get, get you some uh, some leads for your book uh, and for the event was uh, was more than more than our pleasure. So firstly, just a huge thank you to you and everything you're doing as a role model in the space. For oh, you're right bad, all right, so uh, first thing we can jump into is probably just a little bit of background in terms of our community and what we're doing and then the kind of stuff that yeah. we are hoping to do uh, so that you can have a little more context and be able, to, be able to help us help us figure out what we're doing a little bit better. So, yeah. All right, rock and roll. All right. All right, I'll try to speed through this. I don't want to make, the, make this the Liam, so uh, I want to get through it so we can get to the value in the community question as soon as possible. But essentially, uh, this community that we've built and sort of my channel and everything that we're doing is about how to create AI businesses as as easily as possible and making it beginner friendly and sort of accessible to people who are aspiring entrepreneurs. So going back to sort of where this all started, I was a sort of marketer myself, Josh, sorry, introductions. Josh is my mentor and our business partner. Um, we've been doing business for the past couple of years together and we started off doing marketing, e-commerce and things like that. And I saw an opportunity to diversify my skill sets away from strictly marketing. It's more development and it's a Naval quote, which I'm sure you're familiar with the whole build and sell thing. You become unstoppable. And I sort of trained myself up as a developer and was fortunate enough to be well positioned at the start of this AI thing to be able to really take advantage of it. Started the personal brand and saw, look, if we can build an audience here and build really a, uh, a chance to really create a great product and have the distribution networks and things like that, then we're going to be in a very good position. So we're fortunate enough to stumble our way through the YouTube thing, eventually get to nearly 100K now in the past eight, nine months. And through that, we've been able to build a development company, AI development company. And it was through that we're able to really discover what we're now teaching to all of the people in the community, which is how to create what we've called an AI automation agency. Now, this is our framework for building an AI business. And this is sort of a long way and a far cry from what these original AI businesses were once upon a time. As I'm sure when you were putting out your content as well earlier in the sort of AI wave, the, the AI businesses people were recommending were not really businesses. There were little glitches in the in the space time fabric when a new technology comes out you can arbitrage this new thing to copyright and stuff like that but as me as someone who's making this ai business x entrepreneurship channel i was thinking where is the actual opportunity for these entrepreneurs to be able to build the real businesses that's not a gimmick that's not based off some little glitch that's happening for a little bit of a, a few months or a few months at a time so that led us to creating essentially an ai development company and through that we had a lot of leads coming in that we weren't servicing. And eventually we realized instead of having to custom code all of these solutions for these businesses, we could actually use low code and no code tools to be able to service them for basically a third of the price. So instead of charging them $10,000, we could say, look, we'll do it for the low code tool, but for $3,000. And to our surprise, they were actually pretty receptive of it. And they were more than happy to actually get the AI integration and be able to benefit from this technology without having to pay the ridiculous price tag. So with that kind of realization about five five months ago, we realized, holy holy crap, we're sitting on something here that makes AI business and essentially allowing entrepreneurs to facilitate the adoption of AI technology into small and medium businesses. That's kind of the whole philosophy of what we've built here. We've given a framework to building a real- Let me, let me just ask a couple of questions. So when you say the AI agency, is it like, what type of agency is it simply like i look at your business and i think where could ai fit in and like how can it add value is it more like from that perspective or is it like a very specific you like is it content based or you know what i'm saying like is it just like yeah, a, yeah. how's the approach like, let's, what's, let's, what's the end value that's being created or is it different with every single business yeah so that's that's the sort of beauty of it being too general and just saying hey well ai fire your business is not it's not a compelling offer and going back to what you say and all in all your work as well, the method that we've tried to really focus on is something that I'm actually doing a case study to really go back to the, the same place that everyone in the community is currently at, is walking through the step-by-step -step strategy that we've kind of put together and at least our current philosophy of picking one niche and one specific deliverable and being able to focus on that and make, when, you, when you're using software, as, as I don't need to tell you, but uh, you can, the, the replicability is really the, the value there. So if you can create a system and build it once and be able to essentially just modify it in order to adapt it to that business, then you have an opportunity to 
really scale that a bit more aggressively. And we found with our own AI development company, yeah. by doing custom yeah. things and having to change it every time, there's no there's no scale in that. So just to bring it back to to helping the community and particularly the sort of stuff that we are seeing on a day to day. The, the big topic I want to address is how to sell emerging tech. It is a, a I, I know there's a lot of rules that come down to how you teach in your book. It's selling the plane flight versus the vacation. That's all it is. Like if I, if I could tell you that your financials would be absolutely accurate and updated in real time, would you want that? Cool. <laughs> if it, like how much would you be willing to pay compared to what you currently pay? A lot more. Great. What if I said I could do it for less than what you're currently paying? Are you interested? Great. This is what I need. The fact that I'm using AI is irrelevant. So I, I, how did I know you're going to just simplify it down that easy? Yeah. So you just sell the outcome and then you're not really. Yeah, no one cares. Like oh. AI, like AI is great for YouTube clickbait, but for, for sales, it's irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, anything it sounds complicated. Yeah. I think it's anything new and, and like that, that's unproven sounds anything that's going to scare them away. Right. So, well, that was, that was easy. That was like one of the main right. tools I wanted to get across. You want to um, the next 16. <laughs> charge through all the questions like that um okay jumping through like well, you must be getting a ton of businesses and and potentially some a lot of ai businesses that are coming across your desk, desk right now at acquisition.com what are the things that's making uh, sort of jumping out at you and what are the sort of commonalities between things that make you really go, oh well that that seems to have some kind of staying power uh the vast majority of ai businesses that i look at are, are, are dog shit um <laughs> and so they're either they're not real ai which is 99 percent of them um mm -hmm. They're basically just built on ChatGPT, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just like, let's not claim that we're creating a no, no remote, right? Yeah. So easy. Um, on the other hand, it's it's people who have no business acumen, and so they're like, it's totally different. Like the, the normal laws of business don't apply. It's like they have always applied, and they will always apply because they're just how business works, right? Um, and so like those are the, the vast majority of people that I see in that in that that way. I did make a tweet about the opportunity that you're that you're talking about right now because I do think that. AI implementation for Main Street is an enormous opportunity. Mm -hmm. So AI-ifying, if you will. And I, I don't think, I think your first conclusion is right, which is being the custom guy is tough. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's all things to all people, which is nothing to no one. Um, and so getting the audience really like, so if I'm, if I'm talking to the audience now, if you guys want to get into this world, what you want to do is look at an industry or an avatar that you understand well. And so one of the things that like Y Combinator and some of these great, like, you know, legendary investors look at is how much time a founder has suffered and lived through a problem, right? <laughs> like I can talk about breathing because I've had two nose surgeries. I've been falling asleep on my hands since I was in eighth grade so that I could breathe. So like I've lived with the problem for a long time and I've tried many different types of solutions. So I have tons of industry knowledge if I were to start a company like that, right? And so you probably at some point worked in a business. If you have a job right now or have had any type of job, you've worked in a business. That's a great baseline of background knowledge that's difficult to just jump. Like if, even if you were a server at a restaurant for two years, you still will probably know more about restaurants than 99% of people who aren't in the restaurant industry. Like I don't know anything about how restaurants work because I've just never really worked in one, right? But you could probably be aware of because you now also have this understanding of what AI can do to think, okay, there's a hundred problems in a restaurant. Is there one very specific problem that I can solve well? And is very similar between restaurants because as soon as you get the point A to point B, you can create the clear value prop and you can message around that. And so like getting extremely specific, which is, I think what you were saying that you give the advice to is super smart and it makes the problem set really narrow to solve. So you can become an expert. That's a, an inch wide that's, mile deep. It's like the exact, exact same thing. That, and so I think if the audience, you actually have to do that, right? And the yeah. problem, the reason that most people don't do that when they're starting out is because you don't have enough demand. And so you just get, you have so few leads that come to you that you're like, well, I, I mean, yeah. shit, I need to pay rent this I month. And I only got four leads this month and all four are completely different, but I need the money. And so mm -hmm. I get it. Sometimes you have to be a little bit inefficient in the beginning so that you can get cash flow going. But the idea would be to redeploy, like redeploy that cash into getting really concentrated on your marketing, which is what offers and leads is all about, so that you can find that specific avatar that you can over and over again repeat, which is also why referrals are so strong, because if you do a good job, they will send you other people just like them. Yeah, I think this brings us to an important one that I've 
it's, it's part of the this business model that we've really been trying to deconstruct and figure out the best way, which is getting that that market specific knowledge, that specific knowledge within the industry. Because the, the question is, is yes, I can pick a niche to do this AI automation. I can build AI solutions and, and a sort of targeted one. But what is the opportunity that I should target within the niche? And that comes down to either A, as you said, industry experience that you already have, or sort of B, what we've said is finding some sort of partner within the industry. So in terms of finding a partner and these these specific knowledge do you have any any tips on, on how people could do that and what's the most efficient way that you've seen them to do it? it really just comes down to how to have a normal business partnership so all the normal rules of business apply and this person has some specific knowledge you don't have and you should ideally have specific knowledge they don't have because they would they should be asking the question like why do i partner with the people in your community if i'm an ai developer right like why why should i use why don't i just learn that stuff and then i can own the whole thing so that that's similar to, to what you say about regarding SaaS and software companies is that you need to have that person with the specific knowledge or in the, in the case of SaaS, that technical partner who's, whose sole thing is just improved product, right? So um, I want to quickly, before before we run out of time, I want to make sure Isaiah gets his question in because he's the guy who made this all happen. So Isaiah, if you want to jump in and ask him. No worries, question. brother. I'll um, you yeah. one, real quick, if you're trying to figure out which of the problems to solve in an industry, it's just value created times ease of implementation. And so like, that's the equation, which if you chunk it up, it's number of potential customers times gross profit per customer. The ease part is just, you know, operational drag associated with with the solution. So that's how I would think through if I have six different problems I could potentially solve, which one has way more people who have it, which one's easier to do, which one unlocks the most value. OK, we'll make we'll make a whole bunch of workshop resources with us for the community and really unpick all of this. Isaiah, shoot. Yes, sir, Alex. Yeah, I, first of all, I just want to say I've taken a lot away from just like your application of language and like the way that you are so specifically, uh, you're so concise with the way that you communicate. And as a master NLP practitioner, I've like learned to model your like style. And so one of the things that I asked um, Liam was, hey, where do you think from the perspective of Alex's three frameworks, the offer, the leads, and supposedly the money model from your website, we don't know what the third book is. Um, could you share your could you share your insights on where the AI automation model itself might excel or falter? Like where does clarity need to be established first for it to be successful long term? It has to work. Mm. Like that's the biggest thing. Like all the stuff that you guys probably are, are learning or know about marketing and advertising only accelerates the awareness that you bring to the product. And so if the product sucks, everyone will just find out quickly and then you'll have to create a new product, which is why so many of these info guys just keep launching new things because they're really good at marketing and really shitty at product. And so they have to keep making new products, making more promises and then burning more bridges. And that's literally the model, uh, which is horrible and a shitty way to live. And so it makes more sense to figure out like, that's why like the, the more narrow the problem that you're defining the easier it is to do it well. And so like, it's not just like, it feels like it's making your life harder, but it's really picking where you want it to be hard. So like, if you're a generalist, it's really easy in the beginning, really hard to scale. If you're really narrow in the beginning, it makes it a little bit harder in the beginning, but then really easy to scale. And so it's just picking where you want your pain. Mm. Like a, a generalist is gonna have tons of operational drag, very people heavy. The, the, the narrow or the niche audience is gonna have a harder time on demand gen, but the margins are gonna be better and it'll scale better. Mm. But the, I think it's, uh, where the where the constraint will be will, will be dependent on the solution that's being provided. So, like you'll have leads issues if you're super narrow. You'll have delivery issues if you're super wide. Mm. In terms of like where's the constraint, and so it's really just balancing those different variables so that you can create the most throughput in the business. But all of those are dependent on the one big thing, which is like, can you keep the promise that you're making to the prospect? If you do it well, like if you actually like the problem I said, if you could just actually automate the collection of membership dues for a gym or for any, you know, whatever using AI, everyone would sign up for it. It's just how well do you solve that promise and how painful using the value equation, how painful do you make it for a business to actually get it implemented? Mm -hmm. nice. Awesome. Okay. Um, there's, there's one thing I wanted to run through here quickly as well. Uh, one thing that we're starting to see as, as us ourselves actually run and build one of these, these AI automation agencies, now AI development company as well, is that we've always, uh, 
looking at it as a as an agency model compared to other agency models, we're starting to see this sort of hidden benefit that that we're really starting to see come into come into play in our own business. That is that by building a, a development team that is capable, uh, particularly in AI, which is very very handy at this at this time of, at this day and age, um, is having at least from your experience, how crucial is building up some kind of development resources behind you, especially as using particularly the agency model as is not particularly the highest leverage one, right? It's not the, it's not an S tier business model as you, you always talk about leverage uh, in terms of using an agency model as a vehicle to go from sort of broke and unskilled and resource poor to a point where you are able to sort of springboard onto bigger opportunities. So what in the, in, in the sort of realm of SaaS and things like this. So what is, is your take and your experience with how important that development resource is? I mean, it's sure with your event, you must know working with developers can be a complete plan, but having them in-house and, and having a really good team to rely on as you shoot for those big opportunities can be key. Well, I mean, what's your experience been like this and how important do you think that development resource is when you're going for those bigger plays? Very. <laughs> if you're in a service business, the quality of the people that you use to provide the service is the product and so those people usually want to be compensated well because if they are really good then the places that they're coming from will want to pay more to keep them and so you have to give them a great place to work and a financial incentive or some upside that they get exposed to that they wouldn't otherwise like you want them to feel like owners and the best way to do that is for them to actually be owners mm -hmm. now if you want to build a massive team then it might just be like you have to go find like you have to go find the biggest baddest you know engineer that you can and then that person gets upside and then that person uses their influence to bring, you know, the people in their network underneath of them. Yeah. But like, if you were in a, if you're trying to get on the cutting edge of technology, then actually having the people who are good at that is the business. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's good. Cause that's one of the things that I'm really excited for people who are jumping in and creating this. Not only is it like a, an, an easy accessible point, like SMMA or any kind of agency model to get started, but the SMMA thing, it runs to a certain point, but that, that marketing resource, it doesn't necessarily give you, while it is a great resource to have a really killer marketing team under your belt, but the, the development side of things, I, I tend to find at least in our experience has been a harder thing for us to, to create. It's harder because you don't know it. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. It's harder and just that, because you're paying down ignorance tax. Like it's yeah. easier for you to do the marketing stuff because you're good at it. So you know if someone's full of shit on the interview. You just don't know <laughs> if anyone's full of shit on the interview because you have no context. Yeah. So the, hard, so the, hard, the most important hire, which is why I say this, is you need a technical co-founder. You need somebody who has a real stake in making sure that the people who are coming in are actually good. Not that you're checking a box and saying, hey, I have 14 people on my development team. Because anybody in the, in the true high-tech world knows that one amazing developer is more valuable than 100 B developers. But With that level developer also doesn't come cheap because yeah. the opportunity cost for them is significantly higher. And they would want to partner with somebody who has experience growing something big who's, who can fill their deficit. Now, they also don't have context on what you have, so you could be full of shit. But I'm not saying you are, but I'm just saying like from their perspective, right? And so going into that, I think with an engineering type of person, showing as much evidence and data, because that's how most of them kind of think, will help make a case that is more relatable to them. And uh, from your perspective, that's like, this is the hardest part of business is hiring people who are really good at something without knowing the in-depth yeah. knowledge. And that's where like leveraging somebody who might not want to work for you that you do think is brilliant to at least interview or double check on how good they are um, is really valuable. That's where like building a network becomes important. Um, and, and getting even some tests like of aptitude for them to take so that you can at least get some sort of baseline. But it's all going to be about how skilled that person is. Because ideally, if they were as good as you are at marketing, then you guys would probably have a really successful business. Mm -hmm. We've been fortunate enough to to find that find that magical sort of technical co-founder. So um, we're, we're starting to get them really well compensated, both oh. getting an equity as well. So we are off to the race and that's completely changed our business. I can't even stress for, for anyone of you in here that that key hire is just a complete game. I'm sure you've had it, Alex, in your businesses where you've just found that right person and it just completely changes things. So I think we are tight on time here. So I wanted to jump into a little bit uh, of a more sort of general entrepreneurship question, not necessarily specific to this, but uh, one thing that uh, myself and Josh and our, and our team, I really want to get your take on this, but as an entrepreneur, as, as a group of entrepreneurs, myself and Josh and our, our team and all of our friends who grew up with, who we're fortunate enough to work with at the moment, uh, we've always wondered, uh, we sometimes have sort of a, a six hours or a day where we actually get to unwind and, and click off for a bit. And the amount of ideas and sort of 
new things that we discover on those times that we're actually switched off are so hugely valuable. I've always wondered, what if we actually just schedule this in? How, how much further ahead or behind would we be in terms of that lost work versus the, the ideas and the, the, the relaxed attention? So I wanted to know what, how do you incorporate relaxed, at least it's relaxed attention, I believe that was, uh, relaxed attention into your uh, life as an entrepreneur and how important does uh, that play a role in terms of you being able to come up with new ideas? How do you actually bake that into your life? And where do you get your ideas? I just, I try to minimize the amount of meetings that I'm on. That's, that's me. But like every, every role in a company is different. Like an operator, it's tip, you know, creating lots of new ideas is usually not the operator's primary function. Like they're making sure that things are operating efficiently and not going on time and driving objectives. Um, if you're the creator, founder, visionary, strategic thinker, whatever it is, your, your title, then having more time to hop on phone calls with people that are, that can give you information around, you know, a specific thing that you're thinking on, like bouncing, bouncing ideas off stuff, um, becomes more valuable. And so now mind you, that's not like social hour, but like having targeted conversations where you're just getting as much information as you can, uh, can be valuable for me. I have just run my schedule the same way for a while now, which is just, I don't have anything like today is an exception because my whole day is these. Um, but most of the time I don't have anything until one o'clock. Um, and so I take meetings and like one is when they're allowed to start, but even then my team starts booking them back to front. So you know, the, my last meeting might end at 5.30. And so it's like a 30 minute meeting. The next meeting will be at 4.30 that ends at five. And so they book from back to front so that, um, Later that in the morning. so that I have as much free time as I possibly can. And that's because I don't need motivation to work. Like I'll work all the hours of the day anyways. Um, and if the more free time I have, the better ideas I come up with. Okay. All right. I think that's uh, I think that's a wrap. Alex, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for everything you do. Um, we, we all appreciate it so much. Good luck with the rest of these calls and, uh, and th congratulations on the book launch. No, I appreciate it. Let me just say a special thanks to the community. Um, thank you guys so much for, for showing up. It means a ton to me more than I can really say. Um, and I wish I could have this call with every single person, uh, physics, the laws of physics don't allow it. And so hopefully this is, you know, one small step in that direction. Um, if you are, starting one of these businesses, I think it is a good opportunity. Just the, the idea of helping businesses implement AI into their business and being very specific and focused about how you want to solve that problem and getting very good at productizing that solution. Um, there is, there's a fortune to be made, um, in just making businesses more efficient. And so, uh, I would also not communicate it using techno jargon uh, with the person that you're ultimately trying to sell. Just tell them what life's going to be like once this thing is done and ask them if they want that. Sell the transformation and avoid the mechanism. Yeah. All right. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. And appreciate you guys for showing up. Hopefully the book serves you guys well. It has. Thanks so much.